Track 9, Questions and Answers. Professor Rushton, you write as if race is a valid biological concept. Aren't you only repeating the stereotypes of 18th and 19th century Europeans? True, there is a 200-year history of European research on race, but similar descriptions of Africans were made by Arabic and Turkish writers nearly 1,000 years earlier, and some can even be traced back to the ancient Greeks. Today, new methods of genetic DNA analysis agree with the original classifications made by early European scientists based on their observations. But isn't race just skin deep? Don't most scientists now agree that race is a social construct, not a biological reality? Well, biological evidence shows that race is not just a social construct. Coroners in crime labs can determine race from a skeleton, or even just the skull. They can identify race from blood, hair, or semen as well. To deny the existence of race is unscientific and unrealistic. Race is much more than just skin deep. The new data from the Human Genome Project appear to contradict you. I've read that all humans share 99% of their genes in common. If this is so, aren't there far too few genes to account for all those behavioral differences you claim to see? I've seen these statements in the newspapers too, but it's a silly argument. Human genes are 98% similar to chimpanzee genes, but no one thinks that chimpanzees look the same as humans, or have the same intelligence, or brain size, or behave in the same way that humans do. In fact, human beings share 90% of their genes with mice, which is why we can use them to test drug therapies. Much confusion arises because there are several different measures of genetic similarity. A more realistic story about individual and group differences comes from looking at the 3.1 billion base pairs that make up the 30,000 genes. People differ in one out of every 1,000 of these base pairs. Each change in a base pair can alter a gene. Technically, base pair differences are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. Base pair differences are important, and they cluster together in races. Just one change in the base pair for hemoglobin, for example, causes sickle cell anemia, from which many blacks suffer. Other base pair differences affect IQ, aggression, and mental illness. The 3.1 billion base pairs provide plenty of room for large racial differences. If races did not exist, we would not find the same racial pattern around the world and over time. The scientific evidence shows that the politically correct mantra, race is just skin deep, is a case of deep denial. Not all whites are the same, nor are all blacks or orientals. Isn't there more variation within races than between them? There is a lot of variation within each of the three races. The full range of variation exists in all the three major racial groups. Still, group averages are important. Each racial group has a bell curve distribution, with some people at the high end, some at the low end, and most people in the middle. Groups with a high average IQ will have many more people at the high end, and not so many people at the low end. The six-point IQ difference between Orientals and Whites and the 15-point IQ difference between whites and blacks means that a higher percentage of Orientals and a lower percentage of blacks end up in the highest IQ categories. Those percentages have real implications in school and at work. Why do you base so much of your argument on the differences between the three major races? Are you not ignoring divisions and subgroups within the three races? Of course there are subdivisions within the three major races. The Oriental group can be subdivided into Northeast Asians, such as the Chinese, Japanese and Koreans, and the Southeast Asians, such as the Filipinos and Malays. Black and white groups can also be subdivided, 
for example into East and West Africans. Nevertheless, my three-way division serves a purpose. In science, a concept is useful if it groups facts so that general laws and conclusions can be drawn from them. The three-way classification is scientifically justified because it shows a consistent pattern for many different traits, with orientals at one end, blacks at the other, and whites in between. Aren't some of the studies you use, especially those on race and brain size, very old? Haven't they been shown to be examples of racist bias rather than honest reports of scientific facts? Well, even the most recent studies using the latest technology, such as magnetic resonance imaging to measure brain size, give the same results as the older studies. These state-of-the-art studies are much more precise than the older ones, but produce almost exactly the same results. Only political correctness caused the early findings to vanish from the scientific radar screen. If anything, newer studies strengthen the differences. If there is any bias, it is on the part of those who choose to misrepresent both the older studies and the more recent research on race and brain size in order to justify a social agenda that they want to promote. Is the relationship between race and crime valid? Don't the arrest and conviction statistics from the U.S. police departments and FBI reflect America's history of racism? Interpol yearbooks show the same three-way pattern of race differences in crime. African and Caribbean countries have twice as many violent crimes per person as do European countries, and about three times as many as do the Asian Pacific Rim countries like Japan and China. Aren't black Americans really the victims of crime, not the cause? Many blacks are indeed victims of crime, and there are many white and oriental criminals. Nevertheless, the criminals are disproportionately black. Moreover, statistics show that blacks are 60 times more likely to attack whites than whites are to attack blacks. Isn't the material on race and sex a kind of pornography? Isn't race controversial enough without bringing sex and HIV AIDS into the picture? No, because finding out which groups are most at risk for sexually transmitted diseases can help target treatment and prevention and help slow the spread of disease and save lives. You use twin studies to show how much is caused by genes and how much is caused by environment. Isn't it really the interaction of the two that matters? Of course. Every trait is the result of the interaction of heredity and environment. But if interactions are so important, why do identical twins brought up in different homes always grow to be so much alike? It is because heredity plays a big role in development. The older we get, the more our genes, rather than our childhood environments, take control. Even if heredity is important for individuals, does that really tell us anything about race differences? The evidence shows that genes do contribute a lot to race differences. Evidence, for example, comes from transracial adoption studies. Orientals, mixed race, black-white, and black children adopted into middle-class white homes grow to resemble their true biological parents, not the white families who raised them. Mixed race, black-white infants, grow up to have IQs between the IQs of black and white children. Oriental children raised in white homes obtain IQs higher than do white children, even if the Oriental children were malnourished in infancy. But don't most experts believe that the cause of race differences in IQ is environmental, not genetic? A survey published in the 1987 American psychologist found that a majority, 52% of scientists, said the black-white IQ difference was partly genetic. Only 17% said it was entirely cultural. More recently, a special task force of the American Psychological Association agreed that there was a three-way pattern of race differences in brain size and IQ. Perhaps because of political correctness, the task force threw up its hands about the causes and decided to play it safe by saying, no one knows why. 
Is RK theory correct? Haven't you twisted RK theory to fit your own ideas about race differences? Doesn't the RK theory apply only to differences between different species, not to races within the same species? It applies to both. Humans are very case-selected compared to other species. Still, some people are more case-selected than others. Highly case-selected men, for example, invest time and energy in their children rather than the pursuit of sexual thrills. They are dads rather than cads. The RK theory was first used to explain differences within species. I have applied it to race differences within humans. Aren't culture-only explanations sufficient to account for the race differences? Couldn't the life history differences you talk about just be the best response to cultural conditions? Since blacks live in poor environments, doesn't the R strategy make sense? That could be, but the facts say no. Well-to-do, college-educated black women have more sexual intercourse at an earlier age and suffer greater infant mortality than do poor white women who haven't gone to college. That fits with the genetic RK theory of race differences, but not with the culture-only version of RK theory. Orientals, who have a poorer environment than whites, have less sexual intercourse, which they begin at a later age, and they have low infant mortality. Again, that fits with the genetic RK theory of race differences, but not with culture-only RK theory. Why haven't I read this information on race differences in newspapers or seen it on TV? Isn't studying race differences immoral? In the 1950s, the liberation movements in the Third World and the civil rights movement in the United States convinced many people, including academics, journalists, and politicians, that it was morally wrong to look at race differences from a genetic perspective. The goal of equal rights seemed to require not just political, but biological sameness. Many people wanted to believe that race differences were not at all genetic, and some were willing to distort the social sciences by separating them from the biological sciences. In my research, I tried to put all the behavioral sciences back together again. Can any good come from your theory of race differences, even if it is true? Weren't theories about race differences the reason for racism, genocide, and the Holocaust? Well, the Nazis and the others used their supposed racial superiority to justify war and genocide. But just about every idea, nationalism, religion, egalitarianism, even self-defense, has been used as an excuse for war, oppression, or genocide. Science, however, is objective. It can't give us our goals but it can tell us how easy or difficult it will be to reach our goals. Knowing more about race differences may help us to give every child the best possible education and help us to understand some of our chronic social problems better. Wouldn't we be better off to ignore race and just treat each person as an individual? Treating others as we would like to be treated is one of our highest ethical rules. So is telling the truth. The fact is that each of us is influenced by our genes and our environment. Treating people as individuals does not mean we should ignore or lie about race differences. Scientists have a special duty to examine the facts and report the truth. As we have to end this audio CD, do you have any closing thoughts? The information I've provided shows that the races really do differ on average in brain size, intelligence, sexual behavior, fertility, personality, maturation, crime, family stability, and in sports. Orientals fall at one end of the three-way pattern of differences, blacks fall at the other end, and whites fall in between. Only a theory that looks at both genes and environment in terms of Darwin's theory of evolution can explain why. Both science and justice call on us to seek and tell the truth, not to tell lies and spread error. Hopefully the CD audio book will help set the record straight and make the latest scientific findings on race, evolution and behavior open to all.